Hello, everybody. Thank you for um, thank you for joining us. And um, I'm just going to wait a few more minutes. Well, actually, I guess it's because with it being um, straight after the break, I'm hoping that uh, some other people will join us as we um, as we go on. But I'll just go right ahead uh, with the presentations because we've got a little bit of introduction before we get into the bulk of the discussion. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Robert Pratton. I'm the founder and CEO of Conductor. Now we're a, a software company. We create crisis simulation software, but we've commissioned this study on um, modern reputational risks. And I've invited um, some distinguished panelists to discuss the um, results with me. And uh, I'd just like to um, ask my uh, guests to uh, introduce themselves. Maybe Jared, we could start with you, and then we'll head uh, head left to right. Right. Thanks, Robert. Uh, yes, so Jared Wilson. I'm the CEO of Dynamic. We're a crisis management um, advisory business. We also have a proprietary piece of technology. Um, so we have the first crisis management platform ever developed in the world. I'm QNet. I've um, had a 30-year career in risk and. Um, last two years as CEO of Dynamic um, and been with business for nearly six years now. So, um, pleasure to be here today, Robert. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us. Craig. Um, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Craig Badings. I'm a partner at Senator SHJ. I've spent the better part of 30 years uh, helping manage reputations of organisations. Uh, I've seen the best and the worst. <laughs> I've been in the trenches, I've been burnt, uh, and helped clients not be burnt. So uh, it's an interesting space. Uh, we do use Conductor, and in fact, we have used it on a number of clients. And um, uh, simulation, I couldn't recommend highly enough. I'll share some Thank research you, with you later that we do. And uh, yeah, we need it. We really need simulation to get teams tested and tried and see where the holes are. Thank you, Ruth. Please uh, go ahead. Good morning. So I'm Ruth Callahan. I'm an associate director with Cannings Purple. We're a strategic communications agency, and uh, crisis has increasingly become a, a large part of our practice. Uh, we work with large mining companies, particularly, but also schools, um, ordinary corporates, uh, B two C um, companies. The number of different crises and the uh, the nature of them has continued to evolve. So we find that uh, the kinds of work that we do in helping businesses communicate has just become more and more important. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ruth. So, so yeah, to start, uh, but basically, uh, I introduced myself before. So Dave Shaw can't be, can't be with us. He's been sort of dragged off on a client business. I guess that's one of the joys of being a crisis consultant. You sometimes have to you know, get involved in that. So, yeah, so what, I mean, what we offer our clients is basically a way to exercise that's very realistic. So the training audience log into their browser and they experience the unfolding crisis as a first person perspective with different communications channels, as you would see in real life. And that means what you learn on the exercise is directly transferable to, to real life. And um, knowing how popular our queen was down under, I thought I'd uh, just share the fact that we've got this. <laughs> we won this innovation award this uh, this year. So the. Um, the figures that I'm going to present today come from research that we uh, did in the UK, and um, all of the uh, all of the panelists are working in the Southern Hemisphere, and I'm going to invite them to discuss, you know, how transferable are the results from what we've, you know, what we see in the UK to to Australia, particularly, but also, you know, in that part of the world. So we interviewed a hundred sort of senior PR and comms people from I would say like medium big uh, companies either 250 million uh, pounds uh, turnover or 500 plus um, employees and what we found was that um, there are really these five forces that are shaping the uh, reputational risks that uh, uh, customers organizations see right now and the structure of this discussion is going to be around these kind of five areas, the technology shifts and the societal shifts and uh, that we see at the top and bottom there. And then across the horizontal axis, really threats that are coming from activists, from customers and 
employees. And I, be, I believe, Craig, you, you wanted to comment on this slide. Yeah, I find this slide really interesting because there's a part in that slide that's really based on our experience. And whenever we do a forensic, looking back at a crisis with a company, uh, barring an act of God, typically that crisis evolves as a result of culture or a breakdown in culture. Um, and um, all of those threats that you outlined in that model, which are totally relevant, um, can be managed a lot better if the culture of the business is aligned with making it uh, ready for these sorts of threats. And, and there are really seven areas of culture that it impacts. There's a, this sort of shareholder focus versus the customer focus. So, so where, does the, where does the emphasis lie? Does it lie on profit and profitability? Um, and we saw that in the Rio Tinto case of blowing up the Jukin caves. Uh, an aversion to risk. Funny enough, uh, companies that have an aversion to risk or don't take a stand on social issues or they're, they're not prepared to break the ranks, they, funny enough, you know, have potential cultural issues around risk. Lack of governance is an obvious one. Gaps in supervision, another obvious one. Shortcuts that are taken. Uh, we see that often. We saw it with Boeing. We saw it with the Texas oil refinery that blew up in, in, in you know, the BP refinery. And then uh, two others, bland cultures and poor training training and development. So those seven areas really are often where the crises evolve from. Uh, yeah, and those threats that you have in that model are all relevant. But if the culture is not right and is not ready, uh, you're more susceptible to that sort of crisis. In fact, I think there's, um, there's quite a lot of research about how important culture is in, for, for a business in dealing with any kind of issues, not just, you know, and it's not just a crisis um, being crisis ready, but it's also about, you know, achieving peak performance. In fact, I think it was, um, there's a book called Walk in the Talk uh, about a woman who goes in to manage the Australian rugby team. And she basically gets rid of half the players because they don't fit the culture and brings in other people that might be, you know, less of a sort of uh, less like, you know, kind of lower ranked on the spec of, player ability, but actually they fit better with the culture. So, uh, yeah, so let's look at the societal, um, the societal shifts. I mean, what we're, what we're seeing is that activism is now part of people's lives. And there's a big group of people that feel like, you know, modern institutions, like the, the, the institutions that we relied on before or just kind of accepted they don't really work for a lot of people. And they, you know, gone are the days when people would kind of write a letter to a consumer affairs TV show and hope that they got read out on air to pressure someone into doing something. Now they're kind of just taken to the streets and trying to force through a change um, directly. You know, they're kind of, you're kind of empowered to, and, and, they, and they see that these things are effective. So they're, they're turning their back on what might be formal channels and just going to informal channels, trying to sort of mobilize um, like you know, like minds. So this first uh, slide from the research shows that you know 77% of the people that we contacted you know do believe that their brand is at risk from activists and uh, conspiracy theorists, and 65% have have already responded to um, a, a crisis around employee activism, and 57% around consumer uh, activism. Now, these figures are from the UK, but Craig, does this feel like it would ring true in, the, uh, in Australia? Uh, absolutely. I, I had the pleasure, or, sh or should I say I had the displeasure of coming up against a very large and active animal activist group in the 90s. Uh, and in fact, I went to the UK because it was a global uh, issue uh, and it was being run out of the UK um, and subsequently been involved in a number of activist groups since I've learned four things, really, about activist groups. One, they're very smart, they're quick, they're media and social savvy. Uh, two, they really understand a good story. They know how to pull the emotional strings to get to the stakeholders. Three, they, I call it the house of cards effect. They aim for the biggest. So if there's a company that's invested in that company that is a major financial institution, they go for that. It's a pack of cards. Go for the biggest. Uh, be bold and, and, and make a noise because that's your platform. And then the fourth one, and this is, uh, this is something, unfortunately, it's been around for a long time and it's grown, is 
<clears throat> they understand that landing the first message early on, whether it's disinformation or misinformation, by the way, but landing that first message can frame the narrative for everyone else. And they, and they get it. Um, and guess what? The typical corporation, guess how they respond? <laughs> they slow, they over-sanitize the messages. They take 48 hours to get their message out because the lawyers have to look at it. You know, so eventually when it goes out, there's no emotion attached to it. It's too late. They aren't very good at dispelling myths online, uh, and they're typically very reactive. Um, so that's what we face, and I don't think a lot of corporations are really set up to deal with that as well. No, exactly. And I'm going, to, I'm going to come on to that a bit about the activist kind of kind of leveling up, looking for like who can, um, you know, who can give them the most exposure by targeting those sort of like big companies. I'll, I'll, I'll come back onto that later. I mean, Ruth, how big an issue is the employee and consumer activism in Australia? Look, I think it's, it's a really huge issue, but it's also a learned behaviour. So you've got kind of two forces that are taking place here that brands themselves have actually accentuated. And the first is the idea of brand as identity, that you know you identify with a brand, it, it becomes part of who you are and the kind of person and tribe you're in. And the second is the idea of brand activism as community. So in the same way that brands like to say, well, we've built a tribe around our product or our service or, or the kinds of people who do this, when you have brand activism, they're equally a very strong tribe. It's self-reinforcing, and you actually get an enormous amount of social feedback and positive feedback from being able to take up a cause against something that you can unite with other people that you don't know uh, on, on a different front. So when you look at Australia, you might look and say the Lock the Gate movement, which is very much about anti fracking or you look at uh, some of the, the pushes to decarbonise and, and force um, superannuation firms, pension funds, to, to divest from coal assets. There are a lot of cases where these are not um, people saying the brand has done something wrong, but rather we get an enormous benefit personally and socially out of working together to try and force change through the process of, of the community that can go against the brand. No, that's... I think, I mean, it's quite interesting. We we met a, um, a couple just, you know, uh, at some event and they, they were basically like professional activists. They just went from like one sort of protest to another protest every weekend. That's how they filled up their social life. And if you look at, uh, Craig made the point that there's they're very organised and that's absolutely true. We look a lot at, um, and, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say that this activism is bad activism. A lot of the time it's working in, in social causes that's exceptionally important. But there's a lot of sharing of ideas and understanding. There's a lot of understanding of tactics and how that works. They are very sophisticated in terms of being able to work through the, the points that they want to make. And they often come to the argument really well rehearsed. And I think that's, that's a great point about messaging. They know what they want to say and they're prepared to say it. Brands themselves, with corporates, tend to be really, really reluctant to take that emotional, you know, hard-hitting first step. I think, I mean, what you're saying there about, you know, really savvy, um, like I don't, like I, over here in Europe, like um, Extinction Rebellion, they are like phenomenal about the transmedia type uh, activism that they, you know, with you know, street protests, and they always try to go for something that's very newsworthy and, you know, very visual and everything. And again, when you really encourage this kind of consumer behaviour in lots of other ways. So it's not surprising that this is being used in a way that's going to work to people's personal agendas. But, you know, we encourage people to create their own content. We encourage people to um, really take up a message to every, you know, to everyone. They, they really are encouraged to be on the front page as if they're the, the reporters of old. And I think when you look at, you know, uh, Craig mentioned you know, issues back in the 90s. I remember a fantastic list from the 90s that said, what are the big reputation threats to companies? And there were things like terrorism and sabotage and kidnapping. And now it's, you really supported the wrong person um, in an advert. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Somebody drank your tea and put a phone call <clears> and they don't like. So it's a, it's a wide-ranging and complex area that those brands have to negotiate. <laughs> so I, I think that... I think that there's a point, though, and, and Ruth is spot on, there's a point that relates to that if you're a corporate. There are two things you need to be doing. The one is context. I always say context is everything. So if you're in comms, your role is no longer as a PR practitioner. Your role should be de-risking, and de-risking means looking at context. 
understanding that context and how it plays to the business in which you're in, but more importantly, understanding intimately your stakeholders, what drives them, what are their issues, what are they concerned about, uh, which relates to context, right? The two are interlinked. If you're not tapping into that, you're not doing your job as a comms person because you don't have your radar up to what could go wrong or what's coming down the track. And those two things are critical. So, I mean, J Jared, how do organizations manage the strategic risk of these insider threats and employee activism? Yeah, well, there's a couple of ways that they can do it. I think that Ruth and Craig have highlighted um, the role that crisis communications plays. Um, but I think that the thing that organisations need to do, first of all, is understand um, the different threats that they face. And so you know, we're talking about um, activism today, but you know, an organisation can't understand um, the context of the threat without assessing their complete threat environment and understanding what their appetite for risk is. It's not often that we see um, an activism issue turn into a crisis management response. So good, good comms teams are proactive. Um, like both Craig and, and Ruth said, you know, you've got to be on the front foot, you've got to be transparent, um, you've got to be you know, authentic in the way that you communicate. Um, and, and good businesses do that very well because they've, they've identified the threat early um, and, and they're really trying to get ahead of the game. Where I think organisations could be better is actually understanding the role of the business resilience and then building uh, a management system, a crisis management system, where they've actually got um, an ability and capacity within the organisational response to look at uh, these sorts of issues as opportunities as much as it is to a threat. But you really can't do that until you understand the broader threat environment. And we see a lot of organisations focusing on the wrong issues because they don't understand the overall appetite for risk internally to understand how you prioritise when and what you respond to. Craig and Ruth, you want to respond to, to Jared? Or? I, think, I think Jared's dead right. A lot of the, the issues, particularly social media issues, don't work in the same way as a crisis where you've had you know a, a company vehicle um, pulled off the road in South Africa and, and two people taken at gunpoint. You know these are worlds apart in terms of the types of things that a company is trying to manage in terms of risk. But um, if, if I give you an example that's happening today in, in Australia, uh, yesterday a, a traditional men's club voted seventy five percent to to twenty five percent not to allow female members into. The now, today, what's happening on social media is people are going through finding members and then going to their companies and saying, do you think it's appropriate that your chairman yeah. is involved? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. Is, is this your culture that this is the case? So it takes an, a social context issue. It immediately applies it to the individual and the, the corporate. And there's a social media person sitting there going, well, I don't know what the response is. How do I tell my chairman he can't go out for a fancy lunch? So it becomes a really quick moving and and complex issue that doesn't sit easily on a lot of risk management at, at registers. Yeah, that's brilliant. I'm going to let me, I'll tell you what, I'm going to move on the slides and I, we'll come back onto that because that kind of cancel culture um, sort of environment now is, is, is a hot topic, definitely, uh, definitely over yeah. here. <clears throat> so just, so, you know, look, going through that sort of list of these five forces, um, we're moving on now to look at the technological shifts and i think the idea here is that not not only that news travels faster and wider so like any local issue can now blow up to be an international um, issue but it's also that um any consumer any sort of uh, activist is their own kind of media production organization is you know people are live streaming issues you know it could be a complaint or it could be you know some kind of altercation and uh, they can very easily go uh, wide and global, particularly if they kind of, as we mentioned before, like level up, they can get some kind of influencer uh, involved in, in, you know, their complaint or their, or their issue. And the technology is really, really supporting that. So we, um, you know, so we pose this question and 43% are saying that deep fakes and uh, social media pose their, pose their biggest challenge. 31% saying that disinformation is a, is a top challenge. And 77% are, you know, worried about activists and conspiracy theorists. 
So just to clarify what we mean by deep fake and disinformation, I mean, a deep fake is basically a fake that's even more difficult to tell. I think we're, you know, to tell that it's a fake. I think we're quite familiar these days with saying, oh, that's been photoshopped if we if we talk about an image or something to mean it's been manipulated. But um, the idea of a deep fake tends to be that it, we've used that artificial intelligence has been used to create a video or an audio um, of somebody that actually never ever existed. And we uh, online, there's quite a lot of examples where um, at the moment, just for fun, they've manipulated CEOs of companies and, or, or presidents, getting them to say things that they never said. And I think there is a real um, threat of, you know, these fake kind of hot mic issues, pretending that somebody said something when they didn't think they were being recorded. Um, and, ba and basically, anybody can create these now. The software's out there to manipulate that. And, with, and what I mean by disinformation is, is basically lies, <laughs> um, but kind of in a, in a much more coordinated and, and structured way. So it's not just somebody um, saying something which is untrue, but, but you know, really trying to um, make, make something of that, like a coordinated campaign. Um, uh, let, let's say, let's say, Ruth, if you if you had a client who was the target of an orchestrated disinformation campaign, what would what would you advise them? Well, look, I think probably the first thing I'd say is that the the thing with deep fakes is not far off the Trump era fake news problem. It's not that they want you to believe the lie; it's that they want you to distrust something because it may not be true. So you end up in a situation where people are suspending. A, a belief constantly because they just don't know whether what they're seeing is true or isn't true and it moves them into a place that makes them much more susceptible to feelings rather than facts now for a client that may be um it, you know i actually think it's relatively unlikely at this point still that that a lot of activists will use these things because they don't need to they can often take things off a, a, a website or or behavior and i've presented out of context or presented in a way that is, is critical so they don't need to take that extra step but regardless of whether or not um, it's, it's true or it's just questionable, by presenting that constantly, it makes it much harder for a company to turn around and say, well, this is the, this is the case. Be trusted on the beliefs that, that they're putting forward. If they present that, those facts are saying, well, you would say that would be true. So there's already an issue where you lose a lot of nuance, particularly on social media. You can't address things in a complex way. But once you start to introduce this question of it, what is truth anyway, it becomes much, much harder for companies to involve. So some of the things we always say is, you know, having having the ability to own that message, be the first one out there with that message, having a consistent place where you can have those messages seen and, and recorded, even taking things off social where you can, so that your social response is keep bringing people back to a dark web page that exists solely to manage this particular crisis. Those kinds of things become ways that a company can reclaim its message and reclaim the truth around it. It won't stop the outrage and it won't stop the spread of the dis disinformation, but at least lets you start to have a standing point to it where there is some basis of truth. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, it, it's, it's really difficult when disinformation or misinformation is out there to change people's minds once it's set. And there are many, many psychology, I imagine psychology at university, I still have an interest in this stuff and I read a lot about it. There are a lot of studies out there that, it, it, the human mind's remarkable. You can take the, the, the four of us, you can take us into a room and tell us something that's wrong. You can then tell us something that's right. And you can then test us an hour later. And some of the stuff that's wrong we still will trot out as what's right. It's a, the human mind is weird. And the people who spread disinformation and misinformation understand this intimately. I mean, Donald Trump, love him or hate him, he understood intimately the need to get his message across first, whether it was half truth or, or no truth or the full <laughs> truth. He totally understood the human psychology around landing that message. Uh, I'll give him his due in that regard. Um, but it is a huge issue and it's really difficult to manage. I mean, I find that, so when we, when we like simulate these things, we're always thinking, well, what is this faction's existing beliefs? And then we just throw them this information that feeds their feeds their belief because people just fit the numbers or fit the, the data to what they already think is true. They don't, they tend not to question it. So yeah, we all understand confirmation bias. Yeah, exactly. You look at, 
let's take a let's take a global phenomenon, you know, global thing. The end, the, the, the vaccine, COVID vaccine versus anti vaxxers You try and throw a whole lot of facts at anti vaxxers Guess what? It's called the backfire effect. <laughs> Guess what happens? They just dig their heels in even more against, and and it solidifies their position. Um, it's really difficult to change that. So, so Jared, what, yeah. just just on that, Robert. Yeah. So, so there's there's a challenge with that though because um, often um, in in a response, the response team gets focused on fighting the, the issue as opposed to trying to get to the outcome. And the more time you, you try and fix the original issue, you're actually distracted by everything that's going on. So, if you try and address everything, you're actually not addressing anything of any value. So, I think it's really important to be really clear on what you can and can't control and be very clear on what you stand for and then fight for that rather than trying to fight the issue. And it's not just from activism, it's any threat. Um, you know, we've seen lots of businesses through the pandemic trying to fight the pandemic. It doesn't make sense doing that. You've got to understand at some point there's a cutter of, of impact. Uh, your, your best efforts are on your recovery strategies. So it's just been really clear which issue you're fighting. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's really... That's really good. So I'm going to nudge the presentation on, guys. Um, yeah, so it's. I think we touched on this a little bit already about the, I mean, 93% of the uh, survey respondents, you know, agree that consumers are much savvier now about the, the power they wield over brands. And Ruth, what does that mean for your clients? What are you advising them about in this new age? Well, I mean, clients and consumers, they're now a critical stakeholder in any business or relationship. You need to be understanding what matters to them, what they're driven by, what they want from you and what they're expecting. Because a lot of the time, um, you know, particularly when, when we're talking about an issue that bubbles up, it's an, an unmet expectations that's the key cause. That you expect something of a brand and it just fails to deliver. And we see that, you know, obviously in the most simple way in customer service. So... You know, if you look at a, a Telstra or a, or a utility um, social feed, it is just a string of people saying, look, I'm unhappy because of this. Now, that's a relationship that a lot of people have with the, the utilities, but it's not a relationship that is originally the case with the person that sells you socks or the person who makes you coffee. So those kinds of expectations are, are new to a lot of businesses, that they're suddenly discovering that consumers actually think that they shouldn't be using plastic straws in that way and they shouldn't be having, um, you know, uh, things made out of uh, southern China in the sock, sock shop. So there's a, some difference in the expectations that have been placed on a lot of businesses. And that is a shock to me. Some of them think they can just barrel through, but others are actually seeing this as a differentiator so that they can actually build that tribe of, of loyal consumers, build a really strong audience base by being on the front foot and saying, this is what we stand for before it's asked for them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then it's and then it's living up to it. Because I think over here, we see a lot of people kind of, it used to be called greenwashing, if it was an environmental issue, but you know, but I, I see it with lots of companies, they make these platitudes on the website. And then now the employees and everyone expects them to live up to it. They can't just say it anymore. Yeah, it's now called work washing. Oh, work washing. About, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, really critical that you take a stance that, that works for your company. But you see it with a group like Dove, for example, and Unilever. I mean, they are incredibly effective at saying these are the issues that matter to our consumers, even if they're not in the mainstream. They're not waiting to be dragged into this. So a smart company is sitting around saying, well, what do we believe in? What are our values as a company? And you'd be amazed at how often that's not a conversation that takes place in a board level, even before you start to, to get to issues. But then if, that is our, if, if these are our values, what are the things that we want to take a stand on? Is it LGBTQI issues? Is it about transgender issues? Is it purely about environment? You know, ESG is critical, and it's not just the E part. You have to look at right across the board at where your company stands. Absolutely. Jared, anything to add? Just, yeah. yeah, I just think as, as an extension to that, so I agree with what um, Ruth was saying, but I think that the, the role that business leaders can play to support their frontline teams, be it their crisis response teams or their, or their comms teams, is to actually guide them about the risk that the organisation is prepared to, to wear um, and understand what good and bad looks like. And so having those conversations before the event or being very clear in, as Ruth said, what the organisation stands for and, and being consistent and staying true to that 
is, is the most effective way for any organisation to, to be able to respond, but respond in a sustainable manner. Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's pretty tricky because often I, I you know certain statements still leave room for interpretation. So it's still going to come down to the individuals about how they respond, even if they they think they're doing the right thing. It's, it's tricky. I think it's what it's why you need that. I think that's really that. That's why they need to be guided. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think I think that the, the compass for all of this is either your purpose or your values. And Ruth alluded to this. Um, too many companies think it's uh, fashionable and contextual to do something or take, take a stand on something. And when you look at their history or you look at their values, there's a lack of alignment. Uh, or it's seen as trying to paper over the cracks. And we've, there's a corporate scrap heap of this sort of stuff right out there. And so the companies are a lot wiser to this uh, now. And um, there's certainly a number of companies I'm working with at the moment where I've just been blown away at, at, at the depth to which they've gone to align the campaigns they, they, they're picking on with their values and to get their employees involved in that and their stakeholders. Uh, you know, these are companies that are not paying lip service to this stuff. It is integral to what they, who they are as, as a company, their personality and an alignment with their values. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to, again, I'm going to, I'm going to nudge it on. And this is covering up something that Ruth mentioned about the, the cancel culture. So cancel culture is basically the idea of usually a minority targeting particular individual to you know, to prevent them from speaking or appearing or to get certain uh, brands or products delisted. Um, Craig, is this a big thing in Australia? It sounds like it might be from what Ruth was saying. Oh, abs yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is, and it's growing. And look, I, I think cancel culture was founded on the right principles, uh, but it's gone horribly wrong, and there's something very sinister about it now. I mean, it fundamentally was formed so the man in the street could basically make public figures accountable for what they were doing because they were untouchable, really. That's how it came about. Um, but it's moved, and you know, the, the anonymity of social media platforms has given a lot of people, uh, yeah, and they typically reduce complex issues to sort of binary issues. So you're either racist or anti-racist, or you gender biased or you're not gender biased, um, and. Yeah, the issue with I have with it is it, it fundamentally rejects empirical data, but also academic freedom and freedom of speech. Um, that's fundamentally what it undermines, I believe. Um, and I mean, you could call it a social lynch mob nowadays, really. Um, often it's, I think, misplaced outrage. Uh, and there, there are a whole lot of new terms out, out there for for cancel culture, by the way, like digital lynch mobs and outrage culture and um, you know, call out culture, that sort of stuff. So it's morphing into this other stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think basically the slogan of cancel culture uh, uh, is, is really think like us or be cancelled. And, and that's my problem. It's an affront on, this freedom, on, on, on sort of freedom of speech. It's, it's actually, I think, a cancer in, in the sort of body of dialogue really uh, now. Uh, it started off in the right way and but it's just gone it's just turned into something that is ugly and sinister in many instances. And so someone's so someone's just asked in the chat just to give a, a bit of a uh, elaboration on what cancel culture is. It's basically like boycott. It's people calling on others on the public to boycott a particular brand or something. Yeah. And uh, I've got an example from um, a comedian who's um, a vegan. So in the UK, there's a vegan, a comedian who happens to be vegan. And then he decided that um, a friend of his died of uh, some heart disease, decided to do like a heart, a, a benefit gig for heart disease, which he thought was well-meaning. And then all these vegans were saying, how can you do that gig when the Heart Foundation does all these experiments on animals? And he's like, mate, I'm just trying to help out another cause. And now I'm caught between two groups. But so that's the Jared, have you seen, you know, this kind of issue? Yeah, I think, I think we see um, a bit of it, but um, not so much in the areas that we work in. Um, but I think you've, you've got to think about the, the impact. So understand that it's a threat, but ultimately um, 
yeah, some of these issues, and I think it's probably more to Craig's point, you don't you don't have to engage in them. So if you don't agree with it, and you're clear as an organisation what you stand for, and, and it's clear that what most um, what side organisations have usually chosen before you engage, just by their business model, the environment they work in, their products, their services. Um, so you, you don't have to guess too far where the opportunities are. So sometimes it's okay to sit on your own principles and be consistent with them, which I think was sort of the theme before, um, and bat some of that away. But that's, that's having the strength um, to be able to own that, um, but also understand the impact of that as well. I think there's a on, sorry, sorry. I, I think there's a, a, a distinction that needs to also be made within boardrooms between cancel culture and consequence culture, and you can't expect that your business can carry on regardless doing something bad. It can't it can't be you know failing to meet environmental standards. It can't be only employing men. It can't be you know underpaying workers. It can't be involving in wage gap, and expect that there's going to be no consequence in the social world that we have now. So those are very different things to whether or not somebody decides that, you know, you said, I like yogurt on Twitter and therefore that means I hate milk. So, you know, there is, there is an extremist group that will always take offence, but there is a genuine movement towards consequences that companies have to engage in. Yeah, ab absolutely. And um, just kind of in a similar vein, uh, there's, this, there's this issue that 45% of leaders fear their brand being associated with an unsuitable person. And this image that I'm showing is, is a UK example where the Chancellor of the Exchequer, so basically a finance minister, took a photograph of himself, you know, with Yorkshire tea. And then everybody started attacking Yorkshire tea for endorsing the Conservative Party. And they're like, well, anyone can drink our tea. This is not like a planned endorsement. Um, but Jared, I mean, is any publicity good publicity? I mean, can you can you make hay from these sort of controversies? Um, no, I, I don't think you can, because um, I don't think that, yeah, all, all publicity is good publicity, but I, I suppose it, it probably just goes back to um, some of the things that Craig and Ruth and, and I mentioned before. Yeah? Like I said before, you, you've, you've already chosen a side with your business model. Everyone knows roughly what you stand for, um, and you don't have to engage in everything, but I think you need to be really clear in articulating which side you're choosing to be on um, and um, accept that sometimes there's things that you can't manage and, and that there will be consequences to that but equally you need to be able to accept those so um, I, I think it just goes back to what I said before about if you if you address everything then you're not addressing anything of value so you've really got to pick and choose your battles. Brilliant. So just to, just before you move on yes. um, Robert there's, there's a, a really interesting book uh, a guy called Matthew Syed wrote it. It's called um, Rebel Ideas. Um, and he talks about cognitive diversity and how cognitive diversity would have potentially have avoided a lot of uh, crises or issues, one of which was actually the 20, you know, 9 11. But he talks about uh, the one example he uses is if you had a more cognitively diverse team at Gucci when they decided that a black face balaclava could be fashionably edgy that maybe, you know, a cognitively diverse team would have said, hang on, that may not land so well. Um, and so you have these companies where you've got boards or, or, or decision makers and you look at the makeup of them. And this is why uh, gender diversity is so important because it's proven gender diversity leads to better outcomes for businesses, better performance. I mean, it's proven that the research is there. The same goes for cognitive diversity. So companies have to be really careful when they're making these decisions about these things that they actually are thinking quite broadly and have the right people in the room to make those decisions. Um, if it, if, excuse me, Robert and Jared, but if you had you, me, and Robert in the room, I'd probably say <laughs> they may not be as diverse a, a team as we'd want. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. So... Um... I'm going to this, you know, we're getting to the end of the presentation now. So, um, but, you know, the, the, one of the key findings was that 78% of the respondents felt that their brand was un, was unmanageable. And, and Ruth, what, why is it that people might, might feel that way? I think it's, 
it is a recognition of the incredible number of different fronts that you can be under attack. And, and I suppose further to the last conversation, sometimes you can be weaponized by other people's attacks. So you can have one group saying this thing should change, another group saying, well, that thing shouldn't change for, purely for a culture war that has very little to do with your brand. And that's the Yorkshire Tea example. But it's equally the example of uh, coon cheese in Australia. It's, it's, a, it's a cheese that's been around for 85 years. One side said that the name is really inappropriate in a modern context. The other side said, oh, how could you change a brand name for 85 years? Now, the cheese has decided to change its name, but it's been a, a long time coming. This has been a discussion since the 1980s. And now there's one side saying, well, how dare they change their name? I'll never buy it again. <laughs> yeah. so, you, know, you, you feel for the poor cheese makers here, but it's, it's not a situation that a lot of brands are really able to engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and Jared's dead right. You know, you can just have 20 different issues that could any one of them bubble up and become a, a big issue overnight on, on socials. The, the big question is, what's the long-term impact of that? And so when you look at something like uh, Nike, which was the subject of a, a, a boycott over Colin Kaepernick, um, if you look at almost any large-scale brand, but the brand does keep to its course, it keeps its values, it's really clear about what it stands for and believes in, a lot of those uh, peaks and troughs will decline over time. What's more important is how has it built that trust up that it can regain? So has it been sufficiently vocal in the time leading up to the crisis that this doesn't just leave them with nothing? They need to have a, something in the bank and social capital to be able to work through that. That's why brand management so hard because that's a really hard process to go through. Brilliant. And that actually ties to, so we, we used to run this reputation reality research report for many years and the last time we did in 2020, basically um, we found that the three most important things that impact reputation, well, we didn't find that people interviewing told us this were integrity, so that's what Ruth's saying, relationships and then quality of products, and then culture was actually fourth. Um, and it's remarkable, we found that only 50% of Australian companies that we interviewed had crisis plans. And get this, only 7% of them tested that plan ever. I mean, it's just unbelievable, you know. And so you go, well, hang on. You've got a crisis plan, it probably sits in the top, top drawer. Um, and then when a crisis happens, can you rely on those people around you? Do they actually know what to do? Uh, and I've been involved in so many crises, and it's... You know, some people are good at it, other people have never practiced it. And you know what, one of the best things that comes out of testing your crisis through simulation, it's not so much whether the processes work, it's the trust you build in the team. It's the trust you build in the person next to you to do their job. Uh, because when a crisis hits, believe me, you want to be trusting the people around you. Uh, you cannot have a situation where the CEO has to take the load on her or his shoulders solely because they don't trust the team around them to deliver. And that's what crisis simulation does. You, you can actually start seeing whether you can trust those people and what you need to do to up their capability to deal with this stuff. That's, that actually brings us quite nicely onto our final slide because, you know, we, we see that like 84% are worried about, you know, they're, they're, not, they're least confident in fighting cancel culture, 83%, you know, least confident in fighting sort of fake news. And yet 40% of them, have no regular training and, and 34% only do it on an ad hoc ad hoc basis. So this is, you know, speaking a little bit to what you're saying, uh, Craig, that um, some people just, they're just not prepared. They're not exercising enough. Yeah, they're not. And so we did some research because it's always, I've always found it really curious. And often it'll be the CFO or the, who would say, hang on, what's this going to cost us? Ah, uh, yeah, that's quite a lot. I'm not sure we want to spend that money on, on, on that sort of thing. So we, we got a master data science student last year to research the companies on the ASX who'd suffered a crisis. And we looked at four things. The loss of uh, market cap. So on average, the 12 companies we found, the loss of market cap was about a billion dollars. The earnings per share dropped on average by 30% of those companies. The share price took 8 to 12 months to recover. And the negative media coverage, in one instance, and I'm not going to name the brand, had been running for four years. It was still negative. So, we, you know, I, it's like, 
Okay, so you tell, you're not going to spend that money on a crisis simulation. Well, look at the look at the financial impact if you don't get it right. It is huge. Let alone, by the way, that doesn't even touch on the impact on personal lives, uh, both of the person affected, but also the management team. It takes a huge personal toll on people when you're dealing with a proper crisis. What's your experience, Jared? Like yeah, I'd like to add to that. So, um, so. Yeah. One of Craig's opening comments was about um, culture, um, and so I look at it from the perspective of risk culture. So you absolutely you've got to invest in your um, in your training and your exercising. Absolutely critical once you've established the capability. Um, but we've had really good experiences and really bad experiences where, and obviously I won't name names, who have spent very similar amounts of money building management systems but it's the risk culture that's destroyed the investment. So our best clients have a brilliant top-down risk culture. If there's an issue, you put your hand up and you get rewarded for that. Um, where other companies we work with, very similar level of investment, where it's a, a punishment culture, um, we, we see it, it falls down. So it doesn't matter what the level of investment is, um, it's got to be a top-down ownership of, of the risk culture. It's got to be part of the day-to-day -day business, like talking about risk. Um, and then when you're investing around your management system, your regular training, your exercising, doing your lessons learned to update your threat environment, your risk plans, that's only when you start maturing your management system and that's when you build your, your inherent resilience, which allows you to, to be able to respond in a really consistent and sustainable way. And a lot of what we've talked about today is almost like it's single management issues Really, you're building it when you're dealing with multiple complex issues all the time, which is why you need to have that redundancy built into your organisation to it and nurture it um, over time, but it has to be top down. Absolutely. Ruth? Can I just add, I think there's also real value in the approach to your frontline staff on this stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of time and effort goes towards middle management and making sure that people internally are doing the right things, but the frontline staff are often 23 years old and running a social media account. And the risk of that going wrong can actually be a challenge. And while I won't name the company, I think the Australians in the room you know, will be aware of a major retailer that's just had this issue in the last week. And it's a, it's a real issue when you have a social media management team that doesn't know what its boundaries are, but also have been tested as to what's far enough and what's too far. And if you, if you look at Yorkshire Tea, for example, its response to uh, the, the, the tea gate was, was superb. It was funny, it was on brand, it was very, very good. Often though, getting that funny on brand with the report that's gonna try and defuse a crisis is a, a very, very thin line. And if you get that wrong, you can have that exacerbated crisis. Yeah, so where is the focus? Ruth actually raises a really important point. Humour can be really tricky. I mean, I remember KFC, you'll know better than most, Robert, KFC in, in the UK, uh, they couldn't deliver chicken That's food. That's right, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. but, but their, their recovery strategy was fantastic. You know, uh, the, the humour and the tongue-in-cheek stuff and the, even the media release, it was just brilliant. But as Ruth says, you've got to get it right because it can backfire quite badly. I, there was another incident, a, a major international brand, where the, the communications response to the initial issue, the initial issue was um, palm oil, uh, you know, which is the forest in Borneo, etc. So that was the initial issue. But the response from this company became the secondary and bigger issue to the extent where the, the global chair had to step in and apologize on behalf of, ne of this company in terms of their response. So that's the other thing, and it relates to what Ruth's saying about just be aware of who's monitoring the stuff and how they're responding. What lens are they placing on stuff? Because that can relate, that can cause a secondary issue. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to I'm going to sort of wind it down now and thank everybody for for taking part. I think it's been fabulous. I mean, I've learned a lot as well. Not that not that I know a lot anyway. <laughs> so, but I thought it was amazing. So thank you. For, so thank you very much.